everyone. This is Carol Hinkle, president. I'm very happy to welcome you again. This is our fifth lecture. I can't believe it. I want to thank all of you who have so generously taken time to respond to our feedback surveys. It really means a lot to us. And I'm happy to say I've read them all. The board doesn't know yet what they say. And by and large, you're very, very, very encouraging. And that means so much to us. I'd now like to take an opportunity to please introduce Michael Orlansky of our program committee. He's going to introduce today's speaker. Michael? Good afternoon. Today we're very pleased to welcome Katie Wood Kershaw, Associate Curator at the Shelburne Museum, where she organizes exhibitions on American fine arts, folk arts, and decorative arts. Katie is a graduate of Smith College, she earned her master's degree from the Winterthur Program in American Material Culture and went on to earn a PhD in art history at the University of Delaware. Much of Katie's work at the Shelburne Museum is with furniture, textiles, and fine arts collections. Among her many current projects, she's working on a book and exhibition on the life and work of the 20th century American painter Luigi Lucioni. Katie grew up in central Florida and currently resides in historic Middlebury, Vermont. In her spare time, she loves to cook and also finds great joy in tending to the early 19th century Vermont farmhouse that she and her partner share. The title of today's talk is American Stories from the Shelburne Museum. Rethinking Objects in a Virtual Era. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Katie Wood Kershaw. Hey everyone, thanks for that gracious introduction, Michael. It's, uh, it's nice to virtually be with everyone today. It's really unusual. I, I mean, I guess it's getting more usual these days to, um, to, to sort of do this on the Zoom, but um, I really miss seeing everyone. So hopefully the next time we do this, it can all be in person. Um, so from here, I'm going to start sharing my screen with everyone. Um, let's see this. We'll run this from the beginning. Great. All right. So I think we're all set to go. Um, so today, uh, I feel really lucky to be here with everyone. Um, and uh, well, one of the greatest joys of my job is being able to um, share Shelburne Museum's incredible collections with people and sort of take them on the road um, for folks who maybe aren't able to get to the museum or haven't been recently. And um, for those of you who are local, uh, you probably have heard that it's, it's been quite a season, um, just not, not just for Shelburne, but for um, most, of our, most of our cultural institutions this year, given uh, COVID-19 and the pandemic and everything that has happened. Um, and so I thought what I would do today uh, is sort of, I, I want to lay the, the groundwork first, um, let you know that, you know, we'll, we'll start a little bit by talking about um, sort of the reason that Shelburne uh, embarked on this journey to create digital exhibitions um, and sort of some of the challenges and some of the, the really sort of highlights of being able to do that. Um, there were a lot of things that uh, these new, this new digital format allowed us to do that we haven't really been able to do in the past. And so we're sort of using those as, as touchstones. Um, then I thought I would share some of the really incredible objects that we included uh, in our first born digital exhibition. It was called American Stories and it covered four sort of broad categories. Um, the first category dealt with the idea of home. Uh, we also uh, talked about sort of people, travel, and finally we finished up with community. Um, so we'll go through some of those objects today and sort of talk about some of the behind the scenes efforts that we all um, sort of came together and uh, um, wanted to share with, with folks who might not be able to visit the museum in person. I should add um, that we were able to open up this season uh, on a limited basis and the museum will be open for two more days before we close for the fall. Um, so we're open this weekend, Saturday and Sunday from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Um, we do require advanced ticketing, but if you go to our website, um, 
you can you know check to see if there are tickets available and if not uh we do take walk-ins so um that's on a limited basis in terms of our sort of visitation but it's worth a shot if you haven't visited us um so from here i thought what i would do I wanted to start with this overall sort of aerial view of the museum. So this was shot in 1960, uh, just as the museum was opening to the public. Uh, so what you're seeing here, um, this sort of edge down here, this is the north end of the campus. Um, and if you visited us, you know that this is where our Hat and Fragrance textile buildings are. Um, right over here is where the new Pearson Library is. Um, so this is the sort of northern edge of our campus and all the way over here, if you check out where my cursor is, that uh, is the sort of south end of the campus where we now have the parking lot and the visitor center and the big modernist building that we call the Pizzagalli Center for Art and Education. Um, a couple things that I, I really love about this view, uh, you get the sense that the landscape was still developing. But there have been some major changes that our museum founder, Electra Havemeyer Webb, instituted right off the bat. Um, this down here, you'll see uh, the story Ticonderoga, our, our side wheel steamer that all sorts of people love to visit. Um, here is our lighthouse. Uh, and there are a couple other buildings you'll recognize. Here's the covered bridge and Route 7 right here. Um, and this is Stagecoach Inn, which was one of the first sort of galleries in an American museum that was really dedicated to the idea of American folk art, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, so you might wonder, uh, when, when we were, I guess it was back in March, uh, when the pandemic got real, and we realized that many of our best laid plans for the exhibition season, for our high season, usually were open from May 1st to October 31st, and we have all sorts of new things going on, uh, but we realized that we might not be able to open um, and that we might not be able to receive visitors, uh, especially in the numbers that we usually do during the summer when people come to Vermont. And so we decided that we needed to pivot. And one of the big challenges for the curatorial team was trying to figure out how to take this, this incredible 45 acre outdoor campus and encapsulate it in a digital exhibition, right? It's a challenging kind of project. Um, and so we set to work. Uh, we had some parameters. So most of us began working from home in mid-March. Um, and that meant that we, we really relied heavily on our incredible um, tech support team. And uh, we got our VPN set up. We made sure that we had digital access um, and remote access to things like our object database. Um, and the curatorial team started working uh, really in sort of close concert with our collections team, uh, which includes a registrar and all sorts of people who help us manage both our image collection and our objects in storage. Um, we also started working hand in hand with our educators um, who were helping dream up good ideas uh, for educational programming that parents of kids who were working from home um, could use on days when everyone was sort of going stir crazy with the snow. Uh, so, uh, we, we worked sort of to get things together. One of the first things that we had to sort of think about was the fact that if we wanted to use an object for an online exhibition, we had to have good digital photography of that object. And in a collection where we have more than 100,000 objects, um, you know, and, and they range from American fine art paintings and sculptures to quilts to uh, you know, tools, to furniture, to vehicles. Uh, we had to figure out where the good photography was and how that would translate to our online modules. Um, we were also working with a number of sort of strengths and weaknesses within our collection. Um, and one of the first objects that we opened up with when we, uh, when we opened our first chapter of the exhibition, American Stories People, was this extraordinary pastel by Mary Cassatt. Um, it is a portrait of Louisine Havemeyer and her daughter, Electra. Um, and if you all know the museum, you know that Electra was our founder and Louisine was her mother. Um, when Electra started collecting objects, one of the things that uh, really defined her collecting strategy was her deep appreciation for American objects uh, and particularly American folk art. Um, her mother, on the other hand, uh, who had been a suffragette and was active in all sorts of different causes. Um, her mother was deeply interested in French Impressionism. 
Um, she traveled with Electra extensively when Electra was young, um, introduced her to artists and dealers, and really helped her understand what, what art was. She helped um, her daughter really develop this sort of refined eye. Uh, and early on, in fact, um, in some of Louisiane's collecting strategies, she befriended Mary Cassatt, and it was Mary Cassatt who introduced her to a number of French dealers who ultimately um, sort of got Louisine tied in with Monet and Degas and a number of the other sort of French artists of the late 19th and early 20th centuries that we think of when we think about the Impressionist movement. Um, so this is a great, you know, example of some of the really rich objects that we have in our collection, some of the really rich fine art. But it also is sort of unusual in that it's French art uh, that was acquired by the museum in 1996. Um, this was not part of the original collection. So we have objects like this that are sort of outliers. We also have objects uh, like this incredible painting by uh, John Singleton Copley of a gentleman named John Scully. So this, the painting that you see in this photograph was painted circa 1760 in Boston. Um, if you know anything about John Singleton Copley, you know that he left Boston for London to go study at the Royal Academy. Um, after, you know, sort of teaching himself how to paint and observing works in the collections of fellow painters in New England like John Smybert. Um, when Electra began collecting, Electra is in the polka dot dress, if you did not know who she was. Um, when she began collecting, she was interested in so many different kinds of objects that uh, one, of the, one of the things that she did was she developed a sort of bucket list of great American painters that she wanted to have represented her collection. And John Singleton Copley was really at the tip top of that list. So when she acquired this painting, it was really quite a coup. Um, she was excited about it. And in 1960, um, there were a number of uh, articles that were run on the opening of the museum and uh, several uh, photography teams came to take pictures of Electra and her collection. Um, so the painting that you're seeing here, uh, you know, it's representative of a certain idea of what American art was and what you wanted to have in a museum if you were going to um, collect that kind of object. And so she was very proud of it. Something that I especially love about this painting, um, and really it's sort of the surround around it. Um, John Singleton Copley was known to have designed many of his own frames for his works. Um, and our incredible objects conservator, Nancy Ravenel, um, has done a lot of research to sort of think about this frame. Um, and she suspects that this is actually a frame that was designed by John Singleton Copley himself. Um, so these are sort of rare finds in their world and we feel really lucky to have it at the museum. Um, but it also, uh, you know, when we think about current conversations today about representation in museums, um, you know, on the heels of COVID-19, there, there was great, there is great social unrest in terms of thinking about how museums can become more inclusive spaces, how we can better represent our visitors and our constituents, um, and how we can tell a broader multiplicity of stories within our galleries. Um, when, when working with a collection like this, we recognize that because Electra was collecting during the 1940s, 50s, and well, the 1940s and 50s, she thought about objects in a slightly different way than we do today. Um, and so when we survey our collections, um, particularly our paintings collection, we don't have a lot of work by women artists. Um, they just weren't recognized when she was collecting. And so um, it, you know, there are sort of blind spots that we have grappled with and that we've thought a lot about in terms of how to present materials today um, to audiences who frankly are requesting more of us, which is great. Um, we have objects like this. So this uh, is a uh, little folk art sculpture um, that I wanted to pull up today, partly because Shelburne Museum is known for its folk art collections. Um, and when Electra Havemeyer Webb was collecting, these were not the kinds of things that everyone was collecting. There were a couple of her peers who were interested in this, uh, most notably a woman named Abby Aldrich Rockefeller, who you may know uh, because she was the person who assembled the collections uh, down in Colonial Williamsburg. Um, so again, you know, this is sort of the era of a time when people are very interested in concretizing American history um, and in thinking about what that looks like visually and then creating these large outdoor museums 
um, like Shelburne or Williamsburg or Deer, Deerfield or Sturbridge Village um, that featured objects that sort of reminded visitors of their collective heritage. Um, we also are really extraordinarily lucky to have objects like these two portraits. Um, so if you've visited the museum, you've probably met uh, Nancy and William Lawson. Um, so these are two portraits by William Matthew Pryor that were both painted as a pendant pair, say that 10 times fast, in 1843 in Boston. Um, so William Matthew Pryor was known as uh, an itinerant artist who painted all over New England um, and who had this great strength in that he would paint to a series of different price points. Um, the Lawsons were prominent members of Boston's abolitionist community and uh, they were both very active in a religious group where William Matthew Pryor was also active. So they probably met each other there. Uh, the group was called the Millerites. Um, and these paintings are really extraordinary for a number of reasons. First, um, when these paintings of the Lawsons were created, uh, the Lawsons were free blacks living in Boston. Um, and if you've been to a museum uh, that has a great collection of American art, you've probably noticed that there are not that many portraits of black Americans from this period. Um, part of that has to do with the economics of portraiture. You know, it's an expensive thing to have your portrait painted. Um, another aspect of, of why we don't have a lot of these objects sort of in our cultural history um, is that, uh, you know, you could be, you could be held accountable as an artist um, for painting someone who didn't look like you. Um, and something that's really remarkable about these two portraits is that if you see them in person in our galleries, right down here in the lower right hand corner of Nancy's portrait and in the lower right hand corner of William's portrait, um, you'll notice that William Matthew Pryor signed his name on the front of the canvas. Now, he didn't do this for all of his paintings. Um, and so it was this very sort of vocal admission of support for these two people who were prominent within their community. Um, and it was, it was a sort of, sort of act of kinship, um, which as a curator, I really love. I mean, as a human being, I, I really love that. Um, so we have portraits like this in our collection that we were really eager to share. Um, it was interesting, you know, when we think about mounting digital exhibitions, they allow us to do a lot of things that our in-person shows do not. Um, and one of those things is, you know, we can reach people across the country with our objects now. Um, you don't have to visit in person. Um, and while I will always argue for the in-person experience, um, the kind of breadth and reach of a digital project has been really wonderful. Um, these digital projects also allowed us to bring out a number of um, objects and bring attention to a number of objects that are challenging to display for whatever reason. So the seven portraits that you see on your screen now, um, they may look a little funny to you. Uh, they're actually some of, some of the things that uh, most intrigued me when I started at the museum almost five years ago. Um, so these are all grisaille portraits on oil cloth. Um, and they're all portraits of major Native American leaders and personalities um, from the 19th century. And these, these portraits uh, would have been created. So you notice that they're sort of a, a grisaille or black and white palette for most of them. Some of them have a little red, um, but they're not full color like you would expect a, a regular sort of portrait to be. Um, and you also notice that sort of yellowed background on them. Um, the purpose of that yellowing, so usually linseed oil or some other kind of oil was used to treat the cloth that this was painted on and it would result in a, a certain level of translucence in the cloth. Um, these portraits, in theory, traveled around um, and would have been used in a sort of traveling stage show where someone, an orator or a historian or an entertainer, would have gotten up um, and had put these on the stage and there would have been they would have been sort of in frames and there would have been a flickering candle or oil lamp behind them. Um, and with the sort of flickering light from that light source, uh, the figures in these pictures would almost appear to move uh, when period audiences watched them, right? You know, you'd hear stories about them and you would see these works. Um, so a couple years ago, one of, one of my colleagues, Corey Rogers, worked with Nancy Grappinell, our conservator, to get a couple of these set up in light boxes so that we could display them in the galleries. Um, but there's a tremendous amount of work that goes on to do that and we couldn't do it with all of them. Um, so for, for our online exhibition, we were able to sort of bring these out and talk about them 
uh, a little more easily than we could in the galleries, which was nice. Um, it also allowed us to get at some questions of, you know, what kind of representation of um, Native Americans, First Nations do we have in our collection and how can we sort of bring more attention to these kinds of objects. We also have portraits like these and Michael kindly, um, kindly mentioned earlier that I've been working on a project that focuses on the work of American 20th century realist Luigi Luccioni. Um, so these two works are currently hanging in Webb Gallery. They came to the museum as part of the artist's bequest after he passed away in 1988. Um, and they are extraordinary portraits in person, um, but one of the reasons that I really enjoyed being able to use them for our American Stories project was um, they give a really interesting view of what it was to be uh, an Italian-American immigrant in America in the early years of the 20th century. So Lucioni immigrates via Ellis Island. Um, he was born in northern Italy in the sort of foothills of the Alps. Uh, he comes in 1911 via Ellis Island. His father, who was a coppersmith and is represented here on the right, um, was uh, what came over earlier. Uh, and then Lucioni came with his mother and sisters. Alice was one of his sisters in 1911. Uh, by, 19, by the late 1920s, he had visited Vermont at least once. Um, in 1930, he started spending summers here and uh, he forged this really lovely relationship with Elector Havenmeyer Webb, where he actually came and stayed in uh, one of the buildings on, sort of on the property of the Brick House. Uh, so Elector Havenmeyer Webb's Shelburne residence, uh, he would come and paint over the summers. Um, so these objects um, both hold an object, or they, they hold a very close place to Shelburne's heart, um, but they allow us, again, to start untangle those different threads of um, what it meant to be American and in America during the 20th century, um, and how that related uh, both to the state of Vermont and to a sort of larger national conversation. Um, another thing that these online exhibitions allowed us to do was to bring together objects that we might not have been able to get into a gallery together at once. Um, so if you are familiar with our collection, you know that the portrait in the center here of Louisa Ellen Galland Cook, painted in 1838, is it's one of our sort of prized folk art portraits. It's great for a number of reasons. Um, and one of the things that I love about this work is that it was actually located, um, it was found by a high school English teacher named Guy A. Bagley. Um, in the Petersham, Massachusetts town dump. Um, and I believe it was found, hang on, I can tell you this, in 1952. Um, so he found this and Mr. Bagley had seen another familiar picture at the Museum of Fine Arts Boston. And that familiar picture that he'd seen is actually this one over here, the object on the far left of your screen. Um, so he saw some, some formal characteristics that were the same. Uh, he brought this to the attention of um, of uh, Maxim Karolik, who was a collector and dealer at the time. And Karolik eventually sold the painting to Elector Habermeyer Webb. Um, another sort of interesting link to this is on the right of your screen, you'll notice the portrait um, of Louise's sister. And uh, that is owned by the Terra Foundation for American Art. It's currently in Chicago. And so these digital modules allowed us to think broadly across time. Um, if you've been to the museum to one of our exhibitions in the, in the Pizza Galley Center, you may have noticed that often we'll bring in loan objects for exhibitions. Um, and loans during the pandemic were not happening. Um, we had planned for some major loan exhibitions this past summer that logistically just became impossible, um, both because of social distancing and uh, because museums were shut down, departments were shut down, and people were working from home. Um, so these kinds of opportunities on the computer allowed us to do some good work to share objects and create a little more context with our digital visitors. Um, the second module of the exhibition online that we went through was all about travel. And uh, I'm taking this back to one of our French paintings. This is by Claude Monet. Uh, it was a, it's a painting that he executed in Amsterdam. Um, the reason that I, I bring it up uh, is because it's both about the idea of travel, right? So infrastructure, travel, like being far away. Um, it also holds the distinction of being counted as the first Monet that was brought to America. Um, and this, of course, came through Elector's mother, Louisine Havenmeyer, 
Um, it recently traveled up to Denver, so it gets a lot of time on the road. Um, but it, it really, it's a wonderful and sort of representative picture in our collection because it really does get at those those really sort of cosmopolitan threads that underline much of the collecting that contributed to the strength in our collection. Um, so uh, this object, um, it's, it's one of my favorites. It normally lives in the Electra Havenmeyer Webb Memorial Building um, in the parlor, and uh, it's, it's just a great piece in person. Um, we also have this incredible tie at the collection to our collection of historic vehicles. Um, and the shot that you see here, uh, these are two carriages that are displayed right now in the round barn. Um, so just to the, let's see, the west of our visitor center. Um, one of the most interesting things about the formation of, of our museum was that it was really rooted in this collection of historic vehicles that the Webb family gave to Electra Havemeyer Webb. Uh, well, Electra Havemeyer in 1947. Um, so they had this huge collection of incredible vehicles. Uh, they didn't know what they were going to do with it. And she said, you know, if you'll give them to me, I'll start a museum with them. Um, and so it's a sort of unusual place, I think, to start a museum. Um, uh, another really interesting thing about this image, the Concord coach that you see, the big yellow coach that you see on the left of the picture, um, you can sort of think of these Concord coaches as like the Greyhound buses of their day. Uh, they were used to transport people all over the country. Um, these are also the kinds of objects that it's really challenging to get into a gallery, right? Um, so it would be very difficult in terms of sort of condition and space to hang that Monet painting next to this Concord coach. Um, but through the sort of virtues of technology, we were able to bring objects together that we might not otherwise have been able to. Um, this is another really lovely picture. Uh, this is in the lower level of the round barn. Um, and this is one of our sleighs in the collection that I think is particularly elegant. Uh, this was manufactured in Montreal. And I just love the sort of rich velvet. You can sort of imagine someone riding along in this carriage, you know, with a big fur blanket and um, just sort of taking in the countryside. So as Michael noted, I, I grew up in Central Florida. And so getting used to Vermont um, and learning how to really make the most of all the seasons here has involved a lot of insulating layers. <laughs> um, so, you know, I was talking just a few seconds ago about the issue of, you know, how challenging it can be to bring certain kinds of objects into a gallery. This is definitely one of those objects. So I don't know how many of you out there, this is, this is when I really miss having a live audience, but how many of you out there are training buffs? Um, but we have a lot of people who come to the museum who are really, um, really very interested in trainings. We have a fabulous group of folks who take care of our train collections. Um, and uh, what I love about the Locomotive 220, uh, there's, there's sort of, there's a lot to look. So this, this picture was taken um, probably in the mid 1950s. Uh, it was a promo shot uh, when the museum was opening and these sort of new objects were being installed. This lives out on the west side of our campus, just west of Beach Lodge next to the train station. Um, and uh, it holds the distinction of being the last working locomotive, um, and let me see if I can get this right, the last working steel 10-wheeler used on the Central Vermont Railroad. Um, so it's, it's sort of extraordinary. Uh, it was known as the locomotive of presidents because of its use on special trains carrying people, including Calvin Coolidge, Herbert Hoover, um, and Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Um, so the Central Vermont Railway donated the locomotive 220 to the museum in 1955, um, and it's been part of the fabric of our institution ever since. Um, we have paintings in our collection too that relate to issues of sort of the railroad in Vermont and how transformative um, rail was for the state's economy um, and its very identity. Something that I love about this painting, so for those of you who know Vermont painting, Charles Lewis Heidi, uh, he was practicing during the middle of the 19th century. He painted all sorts of uh, notable landmarks in the state. Here you see the uh, distinctive silhouette of Mount Mansfield in the distance. Um, and uh, one of the really cool things about this picture is you notice that the train, so the train is running down here. Um, it's clearly a steam locomotive um, and it is running past these fields of wood that have been cut down. So 
I don't know how many of you know a lot about trees in the state. Um, I've been learning a lot this year. Uh, and the idea of sort of a forested Vermont, um, during the mid 19th century, many of our forests were cut down. Uh, and those, all of that wood was used as fuel. And in many of Heidi's paintings, uh, he gets at this kind of tension between um, the idea of technology and all of the good things that technology could bring to the state of Vermont, uh, but also the sort of corresponding tension and what all that new technology took away in terms of natural beauty and those kinds of things. Um, so, you know, our collection, again, it would be very difficult to see this painting next to the Locomotive 220, but in the context of a virtual world, we could do it, which was terrific. So we have other vehicles, right? Uh, earlier today in that big overview, the sort of uh, 19, 1960 shot of the campus, you could see the Ticonderoga in the distance. And this picture I just love because it's a real, it gives you this idea um, of our founder, Electra, and just how tough she was and how committed to big ideas she was as she put together her, her dream project. Um, so she's standing here on the railroad um, sort of rails that were put in to actually move the Ticonderoga, Ticonderoga two miles overland from Shelburne Bay um, into the museum property. And a great story about this is that uh, during the winter. So they moved it over the winter because of course the ground is frozen and so the boat would be less likely to list during the winter. Um, but there was this freak thaw in February and everyone was very concerned the boat sort of started to keel over a little bit. Um, and thankfully it, it didn't go too far south but um, there were definitely some moments of stress there. Uh, another thing that the online exhibitions allowed us to do that we don't usually do is um, we worked in teams for many of these projects and my team consisted of an educator, one of our preservation specialists who has a background in carpentry, um, and a number of other folks. Uh, and our preservation team was able to create some online modules that actually address, uh, you know, the, the ongoing treatment to objects like the Ticonderoga. Um, he also put together a really interesting module on brick masonry uh, relative to a couple of our buildings on campus. Um, but these kinds of new perspectives, you know, because we had to be very creative in terms of using good photography, you know, using knowledge that most of us, you know, had in our brains already. Um, it was almost like, it was almost like when you get to the end of your refrigerator and you have to go shopping, but you, you don't want to go to the grocery store today, right? Um, so you try to figure out what you can make with what you have on hand. Um, there were days when developing this exhibition felt a little bit like that. And while it was challenging, it was also uh, really instructive and forced us to use our sort of creative muscles in new ways, which I think was good for us. Uh, we have, again, great paintings that complement objects like the tie. Um, we have a really strong collection of marine paintings. This is one of my very favorites by Fitzhenry Lane called Sunrise Through Mist. Um, but again, there's this sort of contextualization inside our gallery spaces that works with the landscape outside. Um, and since we couldn't have people on campus early on, we decided that this was one of the best ways to bring those kinds of objects together. This is another object that you may have missed. Uh, this is a punch bowl, um, and it's known uh, sort, of, sort of at the museum as our Hong Bowl. So what was a Hong? Um, the Hongs were these trading areas in China. Um, they were located in major port cities like Canton. Um, and what you're seeing here actually is a sort of artist representation of what the international offices looked like at the Hong. Now these international offices were occupied by traders. Um, you, would, you would arrive, you would come in, you would negotiate with uh, the people who were selling all sorts of goods. You would place your orders. Um, here you see a little American flag. Um, and most of these flags that were posted represented the different nationalities where people were situated. You can almost think of them as like trade embassies uh, in the late 18th century. So this object, uh, these hongbols were generated generally as um, sort of souvenirs. So think of them as very high-end souvenirs that you could take home if you had been on an incredible mercantile voyage and, and sort of traveled back. 
Um, this exhibition also, uh, you know, we were encouraged to sort of use a variety of different kinds of objects um, from different collections. So uh, one of the major areas that I spend a lot of time with is our textile collection. Um, and this quilt is a really wonderful object. So it's eye catching on the front, for sure. You know, you get this sort of vague idea of patriotism with the stars and the red, white, and blue color scheme. But if you take a look at the back, uh, you will notice that it actually, the back of this bed cover has been assembled uh, using six different commemorative handkerchiefs. Um, and you may recognize some of the places there. Uh, I mean, it says so, I guess, in our label. But um, these were centennial, uh, they, they were souvenir handkerchiefs that were collected in 1876 at Philadelphia's Centennial Exposition. Um, so you'll see here, this building in the very center, um, that was Memorial Hall. That was the building that was constructed in Fairmount Park to house most of the fine arts collections for the, for the exposition. Um, you can think about this entire quilt as a kind of travel souvenir. Um, and, you know, if we were to install this in the galleries, it would be really hard to see both sides of it. But online, we could present both of these and really provide some good context. We could also have objects like these, um, more workaday, everyday kinds of things that sometimes don't rise to the occasion of a fine arts exhibition, right? So the three objects that you see here are actually pockets. Um, we have an applique pocket on the far left. In the center, there's a pieced pocket, well, I guess it's pieced and applique. Um, and on the far right, uh, there's an embroidered decorative pocket with some ruffles around the edges. So think of these uh, like purses for women in the 18th and 19th centuries. Um, whereas our clothes today, many of our clothes have pockets sewn in uh, because we wear more tailored kinds of garments. These were objects that you would actually lace up into your clothes um, and they would hold, you know, everything from a little bit of money to, um, to a watch, that kind of thing. Um, so they would sort of go on the body, but I, I love these because they really represent a kind of movement and travel um, that we don't always think about, that we don't always see. Um, and in the context of a gallery space, they might be lost. Uh, so we're able to give them a little more attention in this format. The same with this basket. Uh, so this basket actually has an extraordinary provenance. Uh, it was, it's known as a Salish carrying basket. We think it was probably created by a member of the Salish nation. Um, and the idea of the basket is that, you know, for many uh, itinerant native groups, um, these are the kinds of objects that you store uh, foodstuffs and other kinds of objects in over the long winter. Um, this object, interestingly, came to us uh, because it was included in Louis Comfort Tiffany's collection at Laurelton Hall in Oyster Bay. And so there's this sort of weird, you know, connection between our collecting at the museum um, and how these objects were collected by other people and sort of the various ways that, that links back. Um, we were making a real effort in our collection to take another look at our Native American collections and to sort of try to think about ways that we can integrate these um, with broader conversations, broader thematic conversations in our exhibitions. So the third chapter of the exhibition, uh, of the digital exhibition, was all about the idea of home. Um, and I'm going to move sort of quickly through some of these. Many of you may know about the Brick House. This was Electra Havemeyer Webb's residence out on Shelburne Farms. Um, the interiors of this house are extraordinary. They are still filled with all sorts of incredible objects. I love this shot of the hall because you get not only all this incredible Peter Hollow wear over here, you have these great rugs, all of these sort of patterned curtains, these Toby jugs over the doorway. You get an idea that this was a lady who really liked to collect. And in a lot of ways, she used the brick house as a kind of object lab for what she would later do at the museum. Um, this is a shot of the dining room, and again, you get that sense of sort of pattern and scale and decorative aspect. These were elements of decorating that uh, Electra brought to the collection itself at the museum, and so you sort of see echoes of this, uh, especially in places like this, Parnas House. So if you've visited the campus, you know that we have a collection of buildings on top of everything else. Um, Parnas House was decorated by a good friend and advisor of uh, Electra is named Catherine Prentice Murphy, and uh, the interiors look something like this. So colonial, all that kind of thing. Again, lots of hollowware, big case pieces, those kinds of things. 
Um, we also have buildings on campus like Settler's Cabin. Uh, this is an extraordinary piece, or extraordinary sort of building that was recreated on site. Um, it was actually built in the 1740s, or sorry, in the 1840s in Charlotte, but we interpret it uh, to sort of the identity of, of a French Canadian settler in the 1790s. And so it's where a lot of our educational programs happen. Um, this, this object in the context of a show gave us some opportunities for really good sort of um, educational uh, projects that we could put together and send out for parents who are working with kids who are, who are at home. Um, we have other objects like this that sort of, you know, get at the idea of, um, let's see, sorry, I just pulled up the questions for a second. Um, they sort of get at the idea of how we furnish the home. Mary Comstock's, Comstock's bed rug, uh, which was, was found uh, in a house basically on the property out at Children Farms. So it was made very, very locally. Um, but it uh, is sort of wonderful from the perspective that it's really hard to hang in a gallery. It's a very heavy object. Um, so uh, we could use the image online in a way that we could in person. Let's see. Okay, we have a few other objects, things that go in the home, like this wonderful stand by Lynn Newell Bishop, who was a Charlotte native. This wonderful sofa that was created in Middlebury in the 1830s. Um, pictures like this that we did a lot of work on in terms of thinking about how to reinterpret to the public. Um, so for those of you who are familiar with Edward Hicks, um, Edward Hicks was known as being a sort of great folk painter. He created things like the Peaceful Kingdom. I think that's probably his most, most notable uh, composition, but Penn's treaty with the Indians was a, a very popular theme of his too. There are at least 10 known versions of this work. Um, and in the context of sort of rethinking objects in the current age, we did a lot of thinking about how we could reinterpret this object in a more expansive kind of way, right? Um, Penn's treaty with the Indians is supposed to commemorate a treaty that happened at Shackamaxon in Philadelphia, or just outside of Philadelphia on the Wissahickon. Um, it was supposed to be this sort of great treaty that brought together uh, English folks and the Delaware Native Americans who were sort of there. Um, but it's probably a myth. And uh, it's probably a myth in the same way that sort of the first Thanksgiving um, or uh, John Smith and, and uh, Pocahontas is. Um, so it's one of those convenient myths that we tell to help to sort of couch a national story. Um, so I'm gonna move through a couple more of these. You know, the, the sort of last section of the exhibition was all about community. And it allowed us to bring out really wonderful objects like this quilt top. Um, this is maybe one of my favorite objects in the collection in that it is just extraordinary to see in person. We included it in a show called Ink and Icons um, that was in our Hat and Fragrance textile building two seasons ago. Um, and if you take a look closely at these sort of blocks, this is the center dedication block. Um, and what that reads, I know it's difficult to see, is Eliza Noble and John Noble, but for being without end, the vowed love we take. Grant us, O oh God, one home at last for our Redeemer's sake. And it's dated 1847. Um, one of the great things about this quilt is that uh, we know that it was created as a sort of gift for Eliza and John Noble on the occasion of their marriage. And it was signed by their friends and family. Um, so all of the sort of wonderful inscriptions in the center of these blocks, this is another one that is sort of a favorite, this little tool block. Um, the name in the center of that reads William Noble. And uh, it's, it's really sort of a nice piece when we think about how the idea of community gets represented in objects. I was gonna talk a little bit about our shaker shed, but we can save that for the questions if you have it. Um, I wanted to end on this object so we can get to some questions. And uh, this is one of the hooked rugs in our collection. It's a rug by a woman named Molly Nye Toby. Uh, it was executed in 1942 and uh, it ended up winning this incredible prize. Um, so Molly, when she exhibited this, uh, it won the first grand prize award at the Woman's Day 1942 National Needlework Exhibition. Um, and it's a rug that portrays a victory garden. Um, so as we've been thinking about sort of ideas of community, 
uh, especially in the face of all of the things that our country has been facing this year. Um, it seemed appropriate to think about the idea of victory gardens and community and how these things sort of get represented uh, in the objects that surround us. So that was sort of a, a sort of brief um, view of the four different chapters of American stories that we put together. Um, it gives you an idea of the kinds of objects that we included and some of the challenges that we encountered while, while doing the exhibition. Um, I think what I'm going to do now is I'm going to open up the Q&A and I'm going to see if I can do this right. Um, and I'm going to read some questions and do my best to answer them. Um, so, let's see. I'm looking in the questions and answers. So, uh, I have a question from Jan Zatzman Orlansky. She says, do you foresee that henceforth, post-COVID, museums will be doing more digital exchanges of art rather than the risks and expenses of transporting large pieces of art? That is a really great, great question, Jan. And um, yes, the answer is yes. Uh, in fact, the major exhibition that I was working on for this summer uh, was a show that was, was called Eyesight and Insight. And it was all about the idea of vision in American art. Um, we had a number of loans from 15 different institutions that we were supposed to bring in for that exhibition. Uh, and when everyone went into lockdown in March, uh, it became clear that it was not going to happen. Um, so the show has been delayed uh, and I'm working with uh, another curator at the museum, Carolyn Bauer, to sort of reimagine what that show might look like down the road. Um, and Whereas before, in the before times, we used to just think about our, our physical exhibitions. Um, we've approached this from a kind of bifurcated perspective. Uh, we are both focusing on um, being able to create an in-person exhibition where people can social distance and all those kinds of things. We are also bulking up our online modules. Um, and so we're sort of thinking outside of the box you know, with blue chip kinds of objects that might be too expensive um, or impossible to bring to Vermont. Um, I know right now I've been thinking about a couple of really big campuses by American painter Thomas Aikens that I would love our visitors to be able to see, um, but they just, they, they don't move uh, because of the condition of the actual campuses. And so, yes, um, this I think has really transformed the way that we're gonna think about these kinds of programs um, and exhibitions moving forward. Um, so let's see. Um, there's a question from Kathleen Ryan. Uh, Kathleen writes, I'm curious about the very bright white of the collars and cuffs in the portrait of the Boston abolitionist couple. How has this white endured time, wear, and soil? Kathleen, that's a great question. Uh, so Often the bright white that you see, um, and I'm not a conservator, but I have a lot of conversations with Nancy Rapinal, our on-staff conservator, about these kinds of things. And often in the mid-19th century, that bright white was achieved through the use of lead white pigment. Um, so a mineral that you, um, you, know, you would use for highlights if you were an artist, that kind of thing, it holds up remarkably over time. Uh, I suppose you wouldn't want to lick it, right? Uh, just like lead paint on the wall, um, but in paintings it really does hold up. And uh, one of the extraordinary things about lead white paint is that it has a way of, uh, over time, if it's, if it's painted underneath another color, it will sort of burn through. And that shadow that we end up getting uh, is sometimes called pentimenti. Um, so it's, it's the sort of shadow of what is underneath coming through over time, the, the sort of color washes on top. Um, it's not something that an artist would have expected you to see, but uh, over time, that's just how the materials change. So I have another question here um, from Kathy Pulowski. Uh, she says, thank you for the new display, display for embroidered samplers. How do they do as virtual objects? Oh, Kathy, I'm glad that you've been to see our new display. Um, so uh, a couple, let's see, a couple seasons ago, we decided that we would up our, our sort of display and uh, the care that we're taking with our collections of embroidery. And uh, when we did that, we decided to construct some new cases that would allow us to unframe many of our embroidered samplers and things like that. Um, and 
show these objects in conditions that were really much better for the objects themselves. Um, that space in the Hatton Fragrance buildings uh, that you've been to also allows us to store all of these objects together in a way that um, when we bring in student groups or things like that, uh, it, it's, it's really much more convenient for sort of pulling objects out um, and seeing them in person, which is wonderful. Um, so as virtual objects, they're challenging. Uh, one of the reasons that samplers are difficult to exhibit in a virtual, virtual way um, is that you need really, really high quality photography of them. If you don't have that, uh, because of the way that the weave pattern of a background fabric and the stitch, stitching sort of details look on your screen, often these things sort of pixelate and they become really hard to display if you, if you don't have a high enough resolution. And so one of the challenges, one of the reasons that you don't see much embroidery uh, in our online exhibitions is that we just don't have great photography of those, of those objects. Um, so that's something, you know, uh, one of the things that we did a lot of thinking about this year after we sort of, you know, really worked through this sort of rush to get online content and resources up for our, you know, members, for our neighbors, for anyone who was interested. Um, we started to think about how we plan for the future. And there are a number of things that we, we have sort of done to try to strengthen our resources moving forward. One of them, um, our collections team has been working around the clock to book both photography shoots and um, to work with the curatorial team to decide what objects we should get new photography of. Um, so in the old days, uh, we used to have this big collection of transparencies, so four by six transparencies. And uh, those transparencies can be scanned. So it's basically a photograph, right? Those can be scanned on a scanner and you can scan them at a high resolution. But over time, the photographic emulsion uh, of those actual transparencies ages and it, it tends to go pink. Um, and so after a certain number of years, there's not much you can do in terms of salvaging those photos uh, unless you go in and digitally color correct. And that of course affects the color that you get in, um, in your sort of final, um, final uh, objects. So I'm gonna go, I'm gonna stop share from here and make sure that I've got all of our questions, but I see some more in the chat. Let's see, oh, here, we've got some more questions here. All right, so let's see the next question that I've got. Oh, here is another question. So um, does the museum sometimes decide to downsize or eliminate certain objects or collections? If so, how might such decisions be made? That is a great question. Um, so we do, any, any museum collection um, as part of a sort of healthy museum collection, museums go through a process called deaccessioning. Now you may have heard about this in the news. Um, every now and then, you know, uh, we will sort of call through a collection and we will make decisions about objects that don't necessarily fit the museum. Um, they may be objects that we can't display for some reason. Um, our, the point of our collections at our museum, everything that we have, we want to be able to display. And if we can't, if, you know, there's a quilt that has a really incredible provenance or history associated with the object that we know isn't going to hold up over display. Um, often we'll try to find a better home for that object where it will be used um, in, a, in a better way, uh, where it will, it will have, it'll be made available to more researchers, those kinds of things. Um, and so, yeah, we actually, we have been thinking about um, the sort of careful process of deaccessions. Uh, we do a little bit every year. Um, not, not sort of big objects in general, but um, any collection sort of goes through this. Now in the news, you've heard a lot about deaccessioning, um, particularly with museums that are deaccessioning bigger works of art uh, that might be used to, um, that might be used, that the funds from those pur pur purchases might be used to then purchase new works of art for a collection that diversify an institution's holdings. Um, and that's something that we're seeing uh, with a lot of institutions these days. 
There's another headline that has made the news recently about deaccessioning. Um, the Association of Art Museum Directors, also known as AAMD, recently put out uh, a statement that uh, allows museums to, for the next two years, um, or 18 months, I suppose, it allows museums to deaccession works um, if they need to for their, for their operating budget. Um, this is something that a museum in the past could be censured for, but because of the unforeseen um, sort of conditions around COVID and all of, all of what's been going on in terms of economics in the country, um, they have sort of lessened those restrictions. Um, that is not to say that Shelburne's planning on anything like that, but um, that is something that's going on that you may hear about in the news. Um, so let's see. There's another question here from Beth Wood. Um, Beth says, does the museum have any plans to incorporate or feature more diversity in the future, especially African Americans in its collections, exhibitions, or programs? Um, so that is a good question, Beth. Uh, we actually have a diversity, equity, access, and inclusion group at the museum um, that has been working for the past six months or so to sort of assess where we're at at the museum in terms of um, our programs, our collection, our outreach, our staffing, um, and to sort of make some recommendations for how we can do better. Um, one of the things that we've become known for at Shelburne is, um, you know, we have these incredibly rich permanent collections. Um, that's sort of the center of what I work on. Um, but we often bring in traveling exhibitions with more contemporary work. And we're looking at those as our sort of opportunities to think about how to expand on the narratives that are already present in our permanent collections. Um, but, you know, newer objects that might cause us to think differently about those old objects. Um, also, uh, you know, working with contemporary artists who um, might have had less representation in the past, right? So those kinds of things we are actively thinking about. Now, the interesting thing about working on what we call museum time is that things tend to happen slowly. Um, we generally plan our exhibitions two to three years out. Um, so right now we are fully booked through the end of 2022 um, and uh, into 2023. Um, and so as we start to make these kinds of changes, um, in many museums, you may see it take a little while for these things to materialize. At the same time, we're thinking about ways that we can invite in community members um, to help us sort of broaden the perspectives that we have in some of our permanent collection installations. Um, and so it's, uh, we're conscious that there's no one right fix for all of these sort of challenges that we are navigating together. Um, but we're making a real effort to think about the ways that we can sort of stay true to our institutional mission um, while also, you know, shaking things up in terms of giving audiences the things that contemporary audiences expect to see. Um, so let's see, Beth also asks, how did the museum decide which buildings it could safely open during the pandemic? With the museum being closed for so long during the pandemic, did the staff have to take any extra measures to care for the buildings or collections? Yes, uh, we, we took lots of, lots of precautions. So if you've been to campus, you'll notice that um, there are only a handful of buildings that have been open this season. Um, they were buildings that we knew we could, one, keep clean. They had good ventilation. Um, and they were buildings where we knew people could safely socially distance. Um, so all of those kinds of things uh, really affected how we were thinking. I see that Carol is back. Um, do we have to have one more question or are we about done? Really quick. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, uh, let's see. Um, oh, I think this is it. Actually, no, I, I think that's it. I think that was our last question. Oh, wonderful. That was perfect, Katie. What fun you brought Treasures of Shelburne Museum to us in our living rooms. What fun. Thank you so, so much. Thank you all for having me. Of course.